At number 10, we start off with Samaritanism. The people of the Palestinian West Bank living on Mount Gerizim, these people, they're referred to as Samaritans. Now, these are the ancient people that are trying to hold on to their ancient past. Their population has reduced to fewer than a thousand people because they were not allowed to marry outside of their religion and later were hit by a genetic disease. When the population was at its peak, the number was around 3 million. The Samaritans that are descended from Hebrews speak ancient Hebrew and they worship in a synagogue. Their holy book is the Samaritan Torah and they believe that the current Judaism structure and religion is not true. It's completely false. From there, let's look at Yarsinism. Yarsani, also known as Kakai in Iraq, is a secretive group of people. Found in the 14th century, this religion believes in reincarnation and still holds to its rituals and carries out its ceremonies in secret. Yarsanis, they consider the sun and fire as holy and they seek oneness and purity in life. There is one way to spot a Yarsani. It is that the men are supposed to grow a mustache, as it's mentioned in their religious text. So yeah, most of them have very prominent mustaches. That's a dead giveaway that they are Yarsanis. They seek safety in their secrecy and they are seen as non-believers by religious people of Iraq and Iran. No one is sure about the population of the Yarsanis exactly, but they are believed to be around 1 million in total. From there, let's look at the Baha'i at number 8. The Baha'i religion was established in the 19th century over in Iran. The religion was founded by a prisoner who claimed to be a prophet. The prisoner declared himself Baha'u'llah, which means glory to God. Now, in the 21st century, it is claimed that this religion has grown faster than any other religion in the United States. Now, the religion preaches unity and peace. It says that all the previous prophets were real, but the last prophet is Baha'u'llah. Baha'is say that world peace is only achievable if all of the people unite under one universal faith. In Baha'i, like Islam, drinking alcohol is completely forbidden and believers are supposed to fast for 19 days during the month of March every single year, similar to the Muslim Ramadan fasting. Number seven leads us to Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is the world's most ancient monotheistic organized religion and it was born in the heart of Persia over 3,000 plus years ago. They believe that Ahura Mazda is the all-knowing God and core Zoroastrians believe in heaven and hell and say that this concept of theirs is actually copied by other religions like Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. The main concept of this religion revolves around the concept of karma, which is doing good and receiving good. From there, let's look at Ali Ilahism at number six. This religion believes that God has been incarnated on earth since the existence of time, and Prophet Ali is one of the incarnations of God. So this religion is pretty much like a merger religion of Shia Islam with the rites and practices of ancient Middle Eastern belief systems. Some sources present the Ali Ilahians as a sect that respect Muhammad and Ali, but disregard the Quran as it was compiled under Umar. They avoid killing any type of animal and they believe that the rules allowing the killing of some animals are created by Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman ibn Affan and their followers. The religion at number five is Druze. This religion originated in Egypt, but later on it was scattered in smaller communities in Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. Druze is an incarnation sect that believes they will be reborn after death. Their religious heroes are Jesus and Muhammad, and they also admire some famous philosophers like Aristotle as well as Plato. Now, this is a minority religion and it survived survived a lot in the Middle East by making partnerships with more powerful political groups. Back in the year 1956, Drew signed a contract named Covenant of Blood that made military services in Israeli armies necessary for young Druze. Now, in return, what did they get? Well, the state of Israel is supposed to
to protect the Druze community at all costs. In at the number four spot, we have the Yazidi. During the last few years, this religious group has been making headlines around the world. The Yazidi group have been attacked repeatedly. This peaceful religious group believes in one God who has given the responsibility of the world to seven angels. The peacock angel is the leader, also known as Melek Taus, and people from other religions, they claim that the peacock angel is actually the devil. Now, similar to Muslims, this religious sect prays five times a day, but they pray while facing the sun, and during the night prayer, they face Lalish, which is their holy city in northern Iraq. Mandinism comes in at number three. This secret religious group was born out of the marshlands, which are now called Southern Iraq during the third century. Now, they speak in their own language along with Farsi and Arabic. They revere John the Baptist and other biblical figures like Adam, Noah, and Abel, which was the son of Adam. Now, these guys, they are masters in building boats and they have been passing their religious beliefs down from one generation to another. They live a nomadic sort of lifestyle on the man-made floating island of the Tigris Euphrates River system. Gnosticism comes in at number two. This religion is thought to have been originated in Alexandria in Egypt and may have preceded Christianity as we know it today. Early Christians refer to themselves as Gnostics. However, Gnostics don't refer to themselves as Christians. Today, it's a loosely defined faith which has historically been made up of a diverse array of groups which differ from each other on different belief systems. God in this religion is known as Monad or the One and they believe that the material world is evil and the only way of salvation is to find the secrets of the universe. The writings of this religion, unlike many others, are actually written by women. Now, we end this episode off at number one. We have Shabakism. This religion is the mixing pot of religion. Now, these people, they live in northern Iraq and their beliefs and their culture are inspired by the culture and beliefs that surround them. The holy book of this religion is written in Turkmen and they are allowed to drink wine and practice confessions like Catholics. Now, the Shabaks, they believe that God's wisdom can be obtained through ritual meditation, which is led by a leader known as a peer. Now, they have not lived a very easy life though. They are often referred to as second grade citizens over in the Middle East and their current population is just about 250,000. Let's just jump into it. At fact number 10, Zoroastrianism is actually an ancient Persian religion that may have originated as early as over 4,000 years ago. And now it's arguably the first religion in the world that was focused on monotheism and it's one of the oldest religions that still exist today. Next up, the thing to note is that Zoroastrianism was the state religion of three Persian dynasties, but this lasted up until the Muslim conquest of Persia in the 7th century AD. As history goes, Zoroastrian refugees were called Parsis and they escaped Muslim persecution in Iran by immigrating to the country of India. Now I want to get a little bit into the origins of Zoroastrianism, like where did the idea even come from? What does the name even mean? There was a man he was a prophet. His name was Zoroaster or Zarathustra as he was known as in ancient Persia. Now he was regarded to be the founder of Zoroastrianism but you see most of what we know about this man Zoroaster does come from what is known as the Avista which is a collection of Zoroastrian religious scriptures but it's kind of unclear kind of obscured exactly where Zoroaster may have lived. Even his specific birthday isn't a hundred percent known but Zoroaster is thought to have been been born in what is now northeastern Iran or southwestern Afghanistan, somewhere in that area over there. It's believed though Whoa. that around the age of 30 years old, Zoroaster had a divine vision and this happened while he was bathing in the river during a pagan purification ritual. On the bank of the river, he saw this very shining and glowing being that was made of light and this being revealed himself to Zoroaster as Vohu 
mana, meaning good mind. Now, Vohu mana led Zoroaster to the presence of Ahura Mazda, the name for God in Zoroastrianism. But not only was Zoroaster led to Ahura Mazda, but it was also led to five other shining beings, and those are known as Amisha Spentas, and that term means holy immortal. And these visions were mind-blowing to him. So of course, with every vision, he asked a lot of questions. And the answers that Zoroaster received served as the foundation of the Zoroastrian religion. So fact number six, let's talk a little bit about Ahura Mazda, the creator of the universe. Now, Ahura Mazda is, according to Zoroastrianism, omniscient, meaning he knows everything. He's also omnipotent, meaning that he is all powerful, omnipresent, so this being is everywhere at all times. It's literally impossible for humans to imagine this type of being. This being doesn't change. This being is the creator of all life, and also this being is the source of all goodness and happiness. So as you can see, there's a lot of similarities when it comes to other world religions, especially the monotheistic religions like Christianity, Islam, and even Judaism. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the influences that Zoroastrianism is believed to have had on the monotheistic religions coming up. All right, so let's jump back into this episode. We got five more facts to look at. Now, for fact number five, I want to look a little bit more closer to Amisha Spentas, which translates, like I mentioned, as holy mortals. What are these kind of beings? Some relate these to angels, but it's not exactly a perfect parallel. So let's take a look. Just like light rays are emitted from the sun but aren't exactly the sun, so Amisha Spentas, they are emanated by God but are not God. So these emanations, they're seen as divine attributes of God, and there's six Amisha Spentas in total. There's the Vohu Mana, which was the one that appeared to Zoroaster. There's also Asha Vahishta, and that name means truth and righteousness. And then there's Spenta Amiraiti, that means holy devotion, serenity, loving kindness. Another one is Kashata Vaira, and that means power and just rule. There's also Haravatat, and that name translates to holiness and health. And finally, there is Amiratat, and that means long life and immortality. More accurately though, these are likened to being like archangels in the religions of Christianity and Islam. But again though, like I mentioned, it's not a 100% accurate parallel. But moving on now to fact number four. For in Zoroastrianism, Ahura Mazda, the name for God, has an adversary called Angra Manyu, and that means destructive spirit. Again, we see another similarity here with this destructive spirit who is the enemy of God, very similar to the popular monotheistic Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, when we look at the evil being Satan, or the devil, or Lucifer in some traditions. So what is Angra Manyu all about anyways? Well, pretty much what you would think. He's the originator of death and everything that is evil in the entire world. Ahura Mazda, who is completely perfect, lives up in heaven, whereas Angra Manyu lives in hell. So when a person ends up passing away, they will go to heaven or hell depending on their deeds during this lifetime. Now many scholars and historians will generally agree and accept that the Abrahamic religions, as well as the concept of heaven and hell and the devil are very influenced by Zoroastrian beliefs. Now I want to talk a little bit about the spread and influence of Zoroastrianism because it was a dominant world religion during the Persian empires. Some scholars say that Zoroastrianism significantly influenced other major religions, like I mentioned, like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And now Cyrus the Great, who is the founder of the Archimedes, Menid Empire, he also was a devout Zoroastrian. So it makes sense why Zoroastrianism was such an influential religion because Persia at one point was a dominant world power. And the beliefs of Zoroastrianism were spread across Asia 
through the Silk Road, which was a network of trading routes that spread from China to the Middle East and also into Europe. And Zoroastrian concepts and teachings and beliefs were believed to perhaps be first introduced to the Jews in Babylonia, where the Jews had been living in captivity for many years. This story, by the way, is also documented in the Old Testament of the Bible. Now, the second last fact I want to share in this episode is about the Zoroastrian symbols. Like many other religions, Zoroastrianism has symbols and insignia that are used to represent the belief. They have the Faravahar, which is a symbol of Zoroastrianism, and it's of a man with a beard with one hand reaching forward, and he stands above a pair of wings that are fully outstretched from a circle, and this circle represents eternity. There's also fire. Fire is a very important symbol in Zoroastrianism because it represents light as well as warmth and purifying powers. Also, some Zoroastrians, not all though, they do recognize the evergreen cypress tree and they view that as a symbol of eternal life. So yes, you'll see these symbols quite often when it comes to Zoroastrianism. And the final fact I want to share in this episode is that Zoroastrianism also has had influences in modern day. Now, do you know that the Zoroastrian god Ahura Mazda was what the name for the Japanese automaker Mazda Motor Corporation was based on? So everybody driving a Mazda, yeah, that right there was influenced by Zoroastrianism. When they initially decided to use this name, the company really hoped that any association with the god of light would actually brighten the image of their first vehicles. Also, on top of that, American novelist George R. R. Martin, who was a creator of the series A Song of Ice and Fire, which later became adapted into the HBO series Game of Thrones, he actually developed the entire legend of Azor Ahai from Zoroastrianism. So we see that Zoroastrianism did have some influence in pop culture. Starting with fact number 10. So when it comes to the Druze religion, it was originally an offshoot of the Ismaili Shia sect of Islam, and it was founded in Cairo, Egypt in the 11th century. Now, Druze is a movement that's named after a religious leader known as Al-Darazi, but he was considered a heretic. Either way, the name Druze stuck with the followers of the Druze faith. Now, this movement continued to be underground, so a little bit hidden from the public. And then in the year 1016, the movement caused a riot in Cairo, Egypt. And at that time, the Shia Fatimids ruled Cairo, which takes us actually to our next fact at number nine. The Druze are actually a derivative of the Ismaili Shia branch of Islam, like I mentioned, but they do not claim to be Muslim at all. Rather, they practice a mix of Shia, ancient Greek philosophies, as well as Hinduism, also known as Sanatan Dharma. Now, their belief in reincarnation and transmigration of the soul is actually borrowed from both the ancient Greeks as well as Hinduism, which gives their faith a very mystical feel to it. Now, another label that's given to Druze is Unitarian, meaning a belief in the one. God. So where will you find Druze anyways? Well, early Druze populations inhabited present-day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, as well as Palestine slash Israel. The Druze survivors ended up in isolated parts of Syria as well as Lebanon, most particularly though in southern Syria in Jabal ad Druze or the Druze Mountains and in the mountains of Lebanon in a place called Mount Lebanon. Also, their total population ranges in Anywhere between 800,000 to 2 million. Again, this is a wide range for estimates because the total numbers is just not clear how many of them exist. Also, similar to other religions, Druze tend to live in close-knit communities, and these communities are partially closed off to outsiders. The Druze faith is not open to new adherents or followers since from almost the very beginning of the faith, proselytizing was prohibited. Proselytizing, of course, means conversion. You share the faith with somebody and they are adopted into the faith. Next up though for fact number seven, another thing that you got to know about Druze, like I mentioned they do not permit conversion to their faith but they also don't permit 
conversion from their faith. Marriage outside of the Jews' faith is very, very rare and it's strongly discouraged. Many Jews' religious practices are kept secret even from the community as a whole. And only an elite of initiates known as Ukal, meaning the knowers, they participate fully in their religious services and have access to the secret teachings of the scriptures known as Al-Hikmah and Al-Sharifa. And by the way, I'll be getting into more information involving those later on in this episode. But for now, let's move on to fact number six. Jews are theologically distinct from Muslims due to their broad system of doctrine, such as the belief in God being able to manifest himself physically to humans and also in the belief of reincarnation. While there are some Islamic authorities that accept Jews to be Muslims, the Jews themselves do not accept that label. Jews don't even follow or accept the five pillars of Islam. They do, however, have their own pillars, if you will. They're known as the seven duties that all Jews are required to observe. And those are the recognition of Al-Hakim, as well as strict adherence to monotheism. There's also the negation of all non-Jews tenets. And then there is the rejection of Satan and unbelief. Following that is the acceptance of God's acts. There's also the submission to God for good or for bad. Then there is the duty of truthfulness. And the final duty is a mutual solidarity and help between fellow Druze. All right, so let's jump now into fact number five. Druze tradition also honors several mentors and prophets, if you will, including Jethro of Midian, which is known as Moses' father-in-law, as well as they recognize Moses, Jesus, John the Baptist, as well as the prophet Muhammad. Several philosophers and other influential people are also held in very high regard by the Druze, including Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and even Alexander the Great. For fact number four, in the recognized state of Israel where the Druze enjoy a big prominence in the military as well as in politics, it far exceeds in terms of proportion to the population numbers. The majority of Jews do not identify themselves as Arabs, by the way. And since the year 1957, the Israeli government has officially recognized the Druze as a distinct ethnic community. And this was done at the request of the community's leaders. So Druze, yeah, they worked really hard to, of course, still hold places of power, but at the same time, keep themselves completely distinct from anybody else. For fact number three, we're gonna be talking about Druze women. Druze women have always had the right to own and sell property, and historically, a significant number of Druze women were literate and educated. However, when it comes to marriage and chastity, there is very little freedom for women. Like, girls are expected to be married by the age of 21 years old. As well as when it comes to intimacy, any intimate act outside of marriage is strongly forbidden. And a female who's guilty of this is often punished very harshly. According to popular Jews belief, a woman's body is considered so sacred or so holy that they don't allow male doctors to perform any sort of autopsy on their bodies after they pass away or even care for it in any way to help preserve it longer. So yeah, I wanted to include that fact in there because I found it very, very, very fascinating, that belief. Anyways, moving on to fact number two, Druze follow a lot of scripture, including the Old Testament of the Bible, the New Testament of the Bible, the Quran, as well as philosophical works by Plato and other influential philosophers and other works of religions and different philosophies that exist. The whole list, I can't even go through all of them. But just to kind of give you an idea though, the Druze claim that an understanding of these is fully necessary. So I assume the list of their scriptures is gonna be forever expanding. But also their al-Ukhal or their knowers they have access to writings of their own that supersede any of these scriptures that I mentioned. These secret writings though are also referred to as Kitab al-Hikmah, which is a book of wisdom, as well as al-Hikmah al-Sharifa, known as honorable wisdom. Other ancient Jews writings include the Rasail al-Hind, which is the epistles of India, and the previously lost or hidden manuscripts such as the Al-Munfarid Bitetihi, and also the 
Al Sharia Al Ruhaniya, among many others. And the final fact I want to end off on is about reincarnation. Reincarnation is an important principle in the Druze faith. Reincarnations occur instantly at the time of one's death because there is an eternal duality of the body and soul, and it is impossible for the soul to exist without the body. So a human soul will then transfer only to a human body. And this is in contrast to the Hindu belief and the Buddhist belief system that say that a soul can be transferred to any living creature. Also, one important thing to note is that a male Druze can reincarnate only as another male Druze, and same for females, they can only come back as another female Druze. So even their concept of reincarnation is very exclusive and tightly knit. Also, a Druze cannot be reincarnated in the body of a non-Druze. Additionally, souls cannot be divided and the cycle of rebirth is continuous. And the only way that a person can escape this is through successive reincarnations. So when this happens, the soul is united with the cosmic mind and it achieves the ultimate happiness. Starting off at number 10, we have Arianism. Founded by Arius, Arianism was similar to mainstream Christianity, but his followers believed that Jesus was a lesser being than God. Arius condemned Christians as polytheists since they worship Jesus in the same way that somebody worships God. Although it was declared heretical at the First Council of Nicaea, Arianism was actually supported by some of the Roman emperors following that time. Number nine brings us Doketism. Doketism comes from the Greek word dokein, which means to seem. And their main issue with mainstream Christianity was that they believed that Jesus' human form was merely an illusion. They believed that he never was actually a human. Doketism was one of the earliest branches that broke away from mainstream Christianity during the first century, and it was condemned at the First Council of Nicaea in AD 325. Following that, at number eight, we have the Naasenes. The Naasenes are believed to be a Gnostic branch of Christianity during the second century, and they were one of the earliest groups to be declared heretical, though. The Nazis, they didn't actually call themselves that. It was actually a given name, and it was given to them by the theologian Hippolytus. And he gave that name to them because they celebrated a serpent. And by the way, Nahash is the Hebrew word for snake. So it was kind of like a derogatory term put on them. Either way, the Nazis, they claimed to receive their teachings from James the Just, who was the human brother of Jesus. Now, the Nazis, they used some books not included in the Bible in their spiritual beliefs, like the Gospel of Thomas, for example. Number seven brings us Donatism. Donatism developed during the beginning of the fourth century, and uh, this branch was really instigated by somebody named Marjornius. And this movement was instigated after a man by the name of Sicilian was elected Bishop of Carthage. Majoranus and many others, they didn't like this because he had been consecrated by a traditor bishop. And traditors, by the way, were people who had given up certain scripture during Emperor Diocletian's persecution. Eventually, Majoranus was replaced by another bishop named Donatus, and Roman persecution followed and Donatism faded out by the 5th century. Number six brings us adoptionism. Now the adoptionists believe that Jesus was not divine at all. And according to them, Jesus was rewarded for his sinless life with the Holy Spirit from God and he became an honorary son of God. So not like the literal son of God. Now the branch was labeled heretical very early on and it did pop up though once again, but it quickly fizzled out for good after that. Halfway in at number five, we have Novatianism. Novatians, they split away from the Catholic Church because they didn't believe that Christians who were no longer a part of the church should be allowed back into the church. Now, this branch was brought about by the persecutions of Decius, who was a Roman emperor who had ordered every person in the Roman Empire to perform a sacrifice to the Roman gods in front of a Roman magistrate. 
And now shortly after the persecution ended, St. Cornelius was elected Pope. And then a Roman priest by the name of Novashen disagreed with Pope Cornelius's policies towards those who were no longer in the church. And he was excommunicated from the Catholic Church himself, but was able to grow a pretty large following. And like many other rejected branches that I mentioned in this episode, they were persecuted and seen as heretics. Continuing now, number four, we have the Cainites. Cainites were devoted to Adam and Eve's oldest son, Cain. The name Cainites, Cain, makes sense. They believed God was a lesser deity who actually punished Cain unfairly. And they claimed that the creation of the world was itself an act of evil intended to keep people away from the true divine being. Because the God of the Old Testament was seen by them as evil and stood in people's way of finding the truth, he was pretty much an obstacle to get through. So the Canaanites developed their own doctrines and they also revered Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus, according to the Bible, and they believed that Judas had knowledge about the truth of God, which was written down in the book called the Gospel of Judas. They believed that Judas's betrayal of Jesus was actually a good thing done on Jesus's part. Now, this branch really started to rise up during the second century, but it lost all of its traction shortly after that. From there, we look at Bogomilism. This branch was created in Bulgaria during the 10th century, named after its founder, a priest named Bogomil. And this branch believed that God had two sons, Sataniel and Michael. Now the older son, Sataniel, rebelled against God and came to earth, where he created the human body. And then Michael, who they also identify as being Jesus before he actually came to earth to be Jesus. Well, that son created the human soul according to Bogomilism. Bogomilism embraces poverty and they condemn showing off wealth in churches. As a matter of fact, they also prefer to just worship at home. They didn't like going to church buildings. They also reject having intercourse, drinking wine, having meat, and they view these as creations of Sataniel. And also they didn't like any relics like crosses or anything like that. And this branch, it really thrived up until the 15th century and then it slowly began to just disappear. Moving on to number two, we have the Encratites. The name Encratides comes from the Greek word for continents. And continents is a fitting word because they abstain from things like marriage and eating meat. They also avoid alcohol completely, and they believe intercourse is actually a sinful thing, even within marriage. According to the Encratites, along with telling Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, well, the serpent in the Garden of Eden told her to also do what animals do to have intercourse. Now, this branch was formed in the second century by the man named Titian, and most of their teachings come from his interpretation of the New Testament. The first epistle of Paul to Timothy in the Bible actually has a passage that may refer to the Encratites condemning them for forbidding to marry and to abstain from meats. And by the way, that was the two main differences between the Encratites and mainstream Christianity. After that, in the Edict of 382, Theodosius the Great outlawed the group, leading them to fade away. And we end this episode off at number one, we have the Catharism. And we end this episode off at number one, here we have Catharism. Catharism rose in Western Europe during the 11th century, and the Cathari, they believed that the God of the Old Testament had created the spiritual world and Satan had created the material world. So they rejected every physical creation, even their own bodies. They believed them to be all contaminated by sin. Now the only way to be saved was to go through a ritual known as consolamentum. And that was where hands would be laid upon a person and that would reunite their soul with the spiritual world. 
The Cathari believed that the human soul was actually a genderless angel and that it was condemned by Satan to an endless sinful cycle of reincarnation. Once transformed into perfects, this ritual that the Cathari would do would require them to live a life completely free of physical pleasure and to stay away from all animal products. Yet they treated men and women equally at first, since the soul was genderless to them, but eventually it began to become more favorable towards men until it just ended up dying out completely. <laughs>